So to talk about personalized medicine today, we have Marjolaine Baldo, head of EMEA for Agendia. Those of you who may not know Agendia, if any, surely know Mama Print, uh, the product which allows for testing for breast cancer recurrence probability and adjusting the treatment. One of the key and oldest personalized medicine products on the market. We have Jean-Paul Détif, founder and CEO of OncoDNA, also in the field of oncology and personalized medicine, and you can tell us more about your company in a few minutes. And we have Jamila Wasin, associate at Medici, um, former team of Index Venture and now an independent VC, if I'm correct. Um, so just a few words about personalized medicine. Um, you know, you probably have been hearing about this concept for years and personally when I joined BCG roughly 10 years ago we were already saying it's the next big thing it's going to be a tsunami we were telling our clients you really really need to build capabilities now because you're going to be in or out and you might die if you're not in the field um, it hasn't fully materialized yet as you probably noticed uh, so why are we talking about it now and today Actually, because we believe a number of technologies, including next generation sequencing, including our ability to, to master and to analyze large amounts of data, are coming to a state of maturity which will actually potentially make this tsunami happen this time. So enough um, with that. Let's hear about the concept and how you think about it, what personalized medicine means for you guys and how you bring it to patients when we come to Marjolaine and Jean-Paul. Maybe, Jamila, we can start with you and you can tell us about how you look at the field broadly and then we'll go into oncology with both of you. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so the way, at least as, uh, as investor, the way Medici looks at it is all related to um, how you can identify the right subpopulation of patients within a disease area, whether it's oncology or anything else, which will help you design the most precise, accurate clinical trial uh, to address a specific issue in a subpopulation and make sure, you know, by uh, lowering or, uh, sorry, lowering or increasing um, a biomarker, you have a clear um, target engagement in terms of molecule uh, of mechanism of action. Uh, so I can give you two examples. We had this company called Padlock uh, that, that we have actually now sold already at preclinical stage. But the idea was really to focus on uh, identifying what were the citrullinated proteins in the patient for suffering from autoimmune conditions. That was the clear biomarker sh telling you, okay, this is a severe or less severe condition. Another example of a recent, very recent company in which we have invested is Chymotherapeutics, where by inhibiting a specific enzyme in the tryptophan degradation pathway, you switch a specific type of metabolites, and then you're able to follow whether your enzyme is really that is really inhibited or not, and whether it correlates or not with what you see happening in the patient. So in that case, it's more related to general inflammatory conditions. But as I said, what matters for us is really to be able to stratify populations of patients to address a, a specific unmet medical need, and it can be a subpopulation, part of a much bigger indication. I can give you another example, which is diabetes. You try to cut this big, uh, this big therapeutic indication into smaller pieces. <laughs> Marjolaine, maybe you can tell us about your vision of personalized medicine and then more specifically uh, how it translates into action with your products. So personalized medicine, it's all about uh, understanding and treating individual, and I usually prefer uh, to use the term individualized treatment rather than personalized medicine. So for a good reason, so at uh, Agendia, we establish a test in order to clearly identify those patients that have a, those early breast cancer patients that have such a good prognosis that they can safely forego chemotherapy. 
So rather than answering the question in regards to which drug is the most effective for the patient, we answer the question uh, if the chemotherapy is needed for the patient. So MamaPrint is a test that uh, has been established based on 70 key genes that are differentially expressed on the tumor tissue. And this is a FDA approved and CEIVD test so that uh, we currently, uh, I mean, have uh, level 1A uh, clinical evidence since the MindDAC outcome that were recently uh, released. So my vision for personalized medicine is more the term precision medicine, is to give all the, the tools for the patient with all the markers to be able to differentiate his cancer. So at Oncodine, uh, we are now on the market since two years uh, with patients coming from all over the world. Uh, we have more than 60 countries and uh, we talk about that also, about the access of this kind of medicine. But what we see now, we have done more than 2,000 patients where we have analyzed the tumor by, uh, we are receiving a solid tumor, solid biopsy. We, each cancer are different. We do not only because uh, next generation sequencing, there is a trend with that. Uh, all, everybody is speaking about uh, revolution of DNA sequencing. I am an entrepreneur since 12 years. My first company was uh, 12 years ago, just after the first human genome, and it was already the miracle that we will do everything with the DNA. What we see with the patient uh, that we do the sequencing of the tumor is that the reality is the complexity of the biology is that proteins are uh, still effective even when you have a mutation in the gene. And so the, the concept at OncoDNA is that we look at the pathway, we look at the different uh, markers, not only DNA, we look at RNA, we look at the methylation, we look at the protein, we look in terms of pathway, and we give oncologists all the options. We don't cover only targeted therapy, we cover also chemotherapies. But that's what's the, part, the, the visible part of the iceberg. Know what you know, what is the enemy, our goal is to follow each patient. And so when we I saw that there was a talk with that, I think very really much that there is a, a big trend and it's very effective, it's liquid biopsy. And so we have developed since two years a personalized liquid biopsy. So there are big players, American players, but here is to really to personalize, is, uh, is we take the mutation that we discover in the tumor of the patient and we do a patient personalized blood test. So each test are different and we follow the marker to have an indication of resistance and uh, about also to see if the, uh, the cancer is coming back before the PET scan. That's, for me, the term of personalized medicine is that you not just do one test at one time, is that you follow and that you collect uh, also evidence of clinical follow-up. Thank you for the... Thank you for this. Um, next question. Um, so we've started talking about what you do today, what you're starting to build for the future. For you, what will be the next major breakthrough or the next major breakthroughs um, which will actually take personalized medicine really to the next level and which will make it the tsunami that we've been expecting in the past years? Thank you. So for, for Agendia, with our, our MAMA print essay, I mean, since the MindDAC outcome, we demonstrated that there are 46% of patients that are currently classified according to the standard of care, so the clinical pathology factor, like tumor size, patient age, tumor grade. So 46% of them are classified um, high risk of recurrence. So those patients, so one out of two women diagnosed with breast cancer, would be eligible for chemotherapy according to the standard of care. Since MINDAC, so MINDAC is an international clinical study performed on 6,696 patients, a 10 year study, randomized, prospective, phase three study, this demonstrated that one out of two women that were previously classified as high risk of metastasis, according to the molecular information provided by, by MamaPrint, 
those patients are in fact on the, the genomic level, they are genomic low risk of metastasis. So those patients can safely forego chemotherapy. So for us at Agendia, with such level of, uh, of clinical evidence, the next step for personalized medicine with your mama print test is clearly the reimbursement. We collected after 10 years clinical studies, sufficient clinical evidence to really go for reimbursement. And I'm really convinced that uh, within the next few years, such genomic essay would be a part of the, I mean, standard of care in internationally, so. So for me, the next breakthroughs, um, if I speak about um, technologies, uh, I will say there is the big hope of immunotherapies, but now since two, three years, what we see is that uh, it was the big hope and now the big fears in some cancers. So we must more understand and find the biomarkers for the response for these uh, new tools. I told just before about liquid biopsy, uh, the easiest way to have uh, an image of what is involving in the cancer. I think liquid biopsy is not a breakthrough when you are in the metastatic cancer. Uh, there are big hope in the future to detect cancer, but that will be a big bet. I don't know, I don't see that it will be in practice before 10, 12, uh, 15 years before validation of that. And there is also, I, I think, another voice uh, is that more for the IT part. Because what we see, uh, really, for our, our side, we have developed uh, an internet platform with more than 10,000 people, is that the patients are more empowered. Uh, healthcare was, was one of the last domains where there are not a lot of uh, internet connection because there was the, the barrier of the medical, uh, the, of the physician, and so on and no patients are more educated, they, find, they will look to find solution, they take their destiny in hands, and what I will see in five, ten years is more the, the power of the patient to be involved in the decision of the oncologist. For the oncologist on my side, but for other fields in the healthcare system also. Uh, so, so uh, for me, I think I would speak more generally uh, uh, including all therapeutic areas. I would say it's also, it's also very important that, uh, authori that regulation authorities really you know, integrate uh, these ideas of having uh, specific biomarkers, specific types of diagnostics, and you know, specific drugs addressed to one type of population. Um, this would allow first to be uh, much quicker in terms of uh, approval for a specific drug and to adjust the design of this trial so that, you know, you, 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 you in the end you need to recruit less patients just to show that this population has a clear um, uh, answers clearly to that type of drug. So for me that's, that's part of the, of the next big thing. The, it has to, FDA, AMEA has to fully integrate this idea of having uh, personalized medicine or targeted medicine um, in, their, in, their, in their scope, basically. That was actually going to be my next question, so I think it's, it's a very good point, and if we're honest, I think it's also part of the big challenges. Uh, how can you make the culture change? How can you make these tests actually be reimbursed and also at a reasonable cost for the company developing them. You know, what does it take to have the right clinical data, the right studies? Um, and I'd love to hear Jean-Paul and Marjolaine on this topic. I know, you know, as Mammaprint has recently completed costly studies. Um, and I'd like to hear about maybe the tone of your discussions with the agencies and where you think this is headed and whether it's going in the right direction and fast enough to actually have this tsunami in the coming years. So first I want to say that it costs a lot of time and effort, right? So Mama Print Signature was, was, I mean, developed in 2013. I mean, today we are in 2016. And we, we currently see a lot of European countries since MindDAC outcome are available. So since the 25th of August this year, we see a lot of European countries opening really the door for, for reimbursement. And this is really the next step on our side. It's to I mean, make re, really open the access to a mama print test without any uh, limitation of uh, patient resource. 
So we collected a cost effectiveness study, but those studies that have to be established also locally in each country. So we have cost effectiveness in the Netherlands, in Spain, in France, but this takes a lot of time until those dossiers are evaluated and until reimbursement can be effectively in place. So in France, for instance, there is a currently a, a highly innovative code called the area chain that allow the conditional reimbursement of uh, the test uh, MAMA print for a period of time of three years during which the HAS is currently evaluating uh, based on the French context what's the real outcome, the impact on the decision change when using genomic essay for MAMA, like MAMA print in the context of the chemotherapy decision. So we are really hoping that after this period of three years in France, we will have also a permanent and effective reimbursement. Um, for the reimbursement, from my point of view, for the, for the moment, I think that uh, the diagnostic was the poor parent of that against uh, the lobby of the pharmaceutical companies. But things are changing because all the social securities or insurance are t changing their model to be as a Marjolaine explained to be to have more a conditional reimbursement, and that's a chance for the diagnostic because we can have the same rules. For our side, we are launching uh, clinical uh, trials. Uh, it will take three years in uh, uh, cancer that are not the focus of the pharmaceutical companies who want to always to be uh, in the top ten of the cancer, but uh, the poor cancer where there are only chemotherapies. And our goal is to sh show that uh, by uh, having an individual approach and uh, taking care of different parameters that we improve the, the, the PFS of the, the progression for free survival of the, the patient. But what we have also in mind is uh, to change the model of the clinical trial. Is that uh, we, are already, we have already orders from all over the world. Some insurance are reimbursing our test in different countries, but we are collecting already the data. So each patient that are in our system is connected on a web platform. So we don't deliver a PDF report and so on to the physician. The physician that wants to work with us must be connected uh, on internet and to see the report. And we ask about the follow-up question. So by the analysis that we are performing, we are doing also our internal clinical trials. And our concept is really to share this information after for the other patient. So the, the information that we have from a patient that is real answering to a drugs that it can be shared with a patient that has a similar profile in another country. And by collecting all these data, after we have no problem to share that with the authorities and to show that we can improve the life expectancy of the patient. So. I would just add on top of that that uh, the good news is that the patients' associations are getting more and more empowered and have starting to have good influence on these regulatory authorities. And I think this is going to be a, a great leverage in terms of how these trials are designed and how uh, you address uh, some specific unmet medical needs for the, for the patient's population. So for me, this is really going to be, um, this, is, this can be a game changer, how, how they're empowered in the future. Yeah. And from your perspective and across the different investments at Medici, do you see that the tone of the dialogue or the fact that there is actually a good dialogue with the agencies is changing? It is changing. We definitely, we're definitely starting to see that. I think uh, the, the gate entrance to that has been the, the, the early trials in immuno-oncology that has shown very, um, very impressive data for, th for some of them. And uh, now this is where uh, they, they really started to understand that, okay, there are some patients that are responding to that specific therapeutic, some are not. We have to analyze more precisely what, what, is bri what it is bringing really uh, in the life of the patients. It's not only a matter of response or uh, overall survival, it's also a matter of how their life was improved. And in some of these patients, it was drastic, the improvement they saw. And I think this opens the door to a better dialogue between patients' associations and regulatory authorities. But now I've been involved recently in a due diligence in a diabetes, diabetes project. And it's, it's interesting to start, it, it's a field where actually the authorities are extremely conservative. 
which makes sense. But at the same time, we're starting to see them hearing more. Um, the big issue with most diabetic people is the hypogly hypoglycemia they experience, uh, some of them on a daily basis. And it's, it's good to start seeing that the authorities are starting to, st to take this into consideration um, in the end points when they, when they look at a trial. So even that is starting to evolve. So I think, I think it's definitely a, a good sign. So you, you think there's hope for the tsunami to finally come? Definitely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think we can open it up for questions, if it's fine with you. <laughs> and maybe it's, uh, ah, go ahead. Does, yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I think um, Jean-Paul sort of opened up my question um, by describing what OncoDNA tries to do is following through. Um, I was at a, a, with a patient in monitoring, really, rather than one test, one therapy. Uh, I was at a conference in Basel two days ago with the head of Novartis Diagnostics, Roche, etc. And a Novartis guy had a very interesting sort of, to, to your point about the tsunami, sort of vision of the future where he says, we have to move away from one test, one therapy, because we, this was mainly about oncology as well, but it goes for other therapeutic areas uh, too. Um, the cancer evolves. Three months from now, two months from now, it's different. So Novartis is actually conducting trials on this premise where they are ready to change therapeutics to competing company therapeutics if that improves the outcome. And he said, essentially, we'll move to uh, a situation where pharmaceutical companies, diagnostics companies, will become service providers in the whole continuum of care. Um, maybe, you know, uh, Jean-Paul, you, you can uh, speak how you about how you see that uh, uh, evolve. Yeah, and just one word, I think it's indeed one question will be whether pharma companies are able to become drug agnostic in some instances to develop real personalized medicine. Jean-Paul. Well, it's a good example, Novartis, because uh, <laughs> we have some studies with them. Um, but Novartis has bought a diagnostic lab in the US to, uh, to be uh, really like in... Um, I don't know if it will continue, but uh, like you see the big player Roche that is involved in the two sides. Um, what I will see from my, from my side for the moment, I want to stay not to be linked to uh, like Foundation Medicine or big uh, competitor uh, that has been bought by Roche. We want to be uh, transparent. My key factor is with all these companies, if they want to play the game, to give access to their drugs, because what we see in our uh, patient that we are doing, we advise sometimes, many times, for off-label use. Uh, because we have a difficult cancer, cancer that are not the main target of the um, pharmaceutical companies, and they are reluctant to give access to these drugs. And so what I hope is to arrive to negotiate that because behind there are the patient, and behind we can have a nice data for them to give extension. So it could be a win-win situation, but uh, I, I, uh, I'm pleased that uh, Novartis is open to, uh, to be linked with other partners. And so, because what we see, for example, we will uh, soon do a publication of the pathway, uh, PK3, PK3 and TOR inhibitors. Novartis is involved like that. But we, are, we have a good indication when you have the mutation that the protein is still working and so on, uh, that uh, the drug of Novartis will not work, but the, the other one will work. And we want to have access to this battery of drugs. So, do you want to add something, maybe also Jamila, on what you see? I don't know if you've had discussions with big farmers through your portfolio companies, maybe. So, can you just recall at the end? What was the end of the question? The can you just rephrase the question? <laughs> what do you see as the position typically of big pharma in terms of being able to become a service provider and being able to be more open in terms of recommending also other drugs and drugs of competitors? I think um, they, 
they're probably the only one ha that can position themselves to do that because they are the big data providers. They are the one running the big phase three trials with lots of patients and I would say robust statistics. So we think that um, they are definitely the platform that should be used to put that in place. And I would even say that um, we'd rather want to see them collaborate doing that <laughs> rather than competing because the more data you put together, uh, the more robust you, you, you end up in your conclusions. And I think this is something, it's, again, um, I don't want to sound too optimistic, but I, I, we, 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 we see some of them starting discussing this way. But this is the only way, to our opinion, this is the only way that uh, you will end up seeing a real change in, in the way they look at the field and they, and they interpret this data. Thank you. Any other question? This is also the end of the day, so I can see maybe you want to grab a coffee. Uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, actually, do you think, I'm here. Uh, do you think uh, big farmers will be open to personalized medicine as it tends to prove the ineffectiveness uh, or reduced effectiveness of some of their already sold and prescribed uh, medicines. So more on, on the question of big pharma, um, I think you've partly started addressing the topic, but you know, maybe you can share more thoughts on their openness. I, I don't know, maybe Marjolaine also, if you've had discussions with big pharma chemotherapy providers, for example, and how you feel the mindset on this front. Well, based on my experience, I, I don't think so. I think that really, also, this is, uh, I mean, one of the key advantages for, for the farm. I mean, to manage, I would say, yeah, better, uh, also, you know, better classification of the, the patient in really defined groups. So, as always, the, the molecular subtyping of the patient, I think they can also better target the patient that benefits from the drugs and also identify those patients that do not benefit from the drug. And I think this is a key for the pharma as well. So I'm sure that, uh, Jean-Paul, you have also something to say about this. Uh, depends on what you call big pharma. Um, I think that the big pharma that are involved very much in R&D and also to, as the example before, like Roche or Novartis that are going to other fields are willing to, to play the game. If we look at uh, what is still the main drugs that are used in oncology, chemotherapies, that are involved by big pharma but coming more from the generic world, I don't think that they want to uh, start with fight and uh, they are doing more pressure to, uh, to still keep the same rule than before. So. You also have to think that they always think very strategically. So for them, uh, there's always the will to um, okay, maybe work on this, like one patient or a, a bunch, like a very limited amount of patients, but then the idea is always behind, how do we expand that? And if there's no potential ex expansion possible, then okay, for them it's going to be very limiting. So this is also what we, what we see. So I think indeed, I mean, for Big Pharma, the question is, are you actually working to preserve your future business because you're working to do something which is really effective and also cost effective? Um, but on the short term, you may be shrinking your patient population and that's always the risk. Um, any last question maybe before we close the panel? So with this, I think we can thank our speakers and close this discussion. Thank you. Thank you.